All right, we're going to kick off tonight. Uh, thank you guys for watching The Rabbit Show. We have a very special guest with us tonight. We have Jay Haraz. He is a rabbit, or he's raised rabbits for a very long time. He is a vet. He's the chair of the ARBA's Rabbit and KV Health Committee and an ARBA judge. Uh, with all the devastating impact that we've seen across the um, southwestern United States and how uh, RHD has impacted uh, rabbit, rabbit trees and wild rabbits in those areas. Uh, we're really excited to hear how uh, Jay sees the, the future within the hobby and how we can meet the challenge of the day, as I know that the hobby will continue to go on. So um, I'm gonna kick, turn it over to Jay and uh, look forward to this presentation. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, David. Um, and thank you for offering this to everybody. I've uh, been really cool to watch the different videos that you've shared with uh, the ARBA membership. And um, I encourage you to, you know, remember that this is just one piece of the puzzle. Um, there's really good videos to watch about all different facets of this. So um, I encourage you to look at those at some point. Um, like David said, my name is Jay Harais. Uh, for those of you who have not met me, um, I am a veterinarian and I've been one for about 12 years now. I, um, and uh, I've been an ARBA judge now for 18 years actually a long time. I don't judge much anymore because um, I uh, decided to become a business owner and then uh, lightning struck twice and I decided to become a business owner a second time. So, um, And then in uh, 2009, I uh, became the ARBA District 9 Director and the Chair of the ARBA Rabbit and KV Health Committee and um, I've been the Chair of the Health Committee since then and probably seen a lot of my articles in the Domestic Rabbits and you've probably also seen um, some of my correspondence and discussions with the ARBA about uh, the big topic of RHD. So today's talk is about RHD and how it's going to change the landscape of domestic rabbits in the USA. I think it's important to recognize the fact that um, it's not just going to change show rabbits, it's going to change pet rabbits, it's going to change the meat industry, uh, it's going to change the lab industry, how people use them, uh, all different types of ways in the, the industry going forward. Um, just a reminder that we do have an ARBA Rabbit and KV Health Committee. Um, these folks are scattered throughout the country. One of them is in Hawaii, actually. And um, most of us are affiliated with the healthcare industry. Um, some of us are in uh, epidemiology, uh, animal science, and uh, several veterinarians. So um, if you live in areas of the country where these individuals live, uh, reach out to them. They have uh, a lot of insight um, and unique perspective because rabbit breeders are not the same as pet rabbit owners and they are not the same as laboratory animals. So we have a unique perspective we can share with you. Um, a little bit about my background. I am a Graduate of Penn State University. I'm originally from Pennsylvania. I'm a, a Nittany Lion through and through. I love Penn State. I um, wish I could go back right now. Obviously not the best time to be there. Um, I'm pretty bummed that Big Ten football has been canceled for the season. Uh, I went to Penn's vet school and graduated in 2008. Um, and then shortly after that, I started at my first job and I've been there since at Ebenezer Animal Hospital in Rock Hill, South Carolina, which is right over the border of um, Charlotte. And um, I was um, in 2016, um, I had the unique opportunity to buy into my practice and become one of the owners, which was really frightening, but cool and opened a lot of opportunities for me. And um, in 2019, I decided to take that one step further and um, make my own hospital, Queen City Animal Hospital, which is um, within five minutes of Uptown Charlotte. So uh, different clientele, different types of people. It's been fun, a uh, little bit nerve wracking during this whole COVID pandemic, but that's a different topic. Uh, you know, never in a million years would I think that the rabbit industry would be so prominently featured in national media. Um, the article above is from CNN uh, talking about rabbits are facing a deadly virus of their own. Um, July 29th, the article below, the wild, uh, wildlife um, in Wyoming, they're already testing them because they're just assuming that they're going to get RHD. Um, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And uh, stuff like that's important to keep track of. Um, then, uh, you know, in, when all this was going down in 
March, April, and May, uh, random folks were calling my phone just trying to interview me. Uh, the Washington Post e uh, interviewed me for the article above, um, and then uh, the, New the New Yorker emailed me for this um, neat. Uh, it's a whimsical article, much like much a lot of the stuff in the New Yorker about the uh, rabbit outbreak. Um, I'm like the random. I don't have my name quoted in that one. I just have a random quote about uh, something regarding the vaccine industry where they there's not enough money in rabbits. But uh, it was interesting to talk to these people because a lot of them had absolutely no idea how the rabbit industry works, which you know you probably have to explain that to a lot, a lot to your friends. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the virus. You know, um, it's rabbit hemorrhagic disease, the main word hemorrhage in there. So um, we think about uh, bleeding. The single stranded, single stranded non enveloped RNA virus. And um, the most common one that was associated with um, rabbits was the one discovered in China back in 1984 and had a pretty devastating effect. Many hundred, uh, hundreds of millions of rabbits were lost. And um, uh, we don't really know why it developed. Um, I mean, viruses do what they want. Uh, we don't know why COVID decided to develop. So, um, uh, but it developed and it spread rapidly. And um, and then RHDV2, which is the more recent virus um, that has developed, uh, started in Europe. And uh, we haven't really seen much of it here in the United States, thankfully. Um, uh, in Ohio, we saw it in 2018 in a random outbreak. Um, there were outbreaks in um, the Pacific Northwest, especially around places that have feral rabbit populations and uh, moved down to Washington state. And, um, uh, but that all changed because one could say that we're, we don't really worry that much in the United States because we have um, not much in terms of feral domestic rabbits living around us. Most of what we see are wild rabbits. So cottontails, jackrabbits, things like that, depending on where you live in the United States. But, um, for whatever reason, um, evolution happened. And in around March 2020, that virus decided to mutate and jump from domestic rabbits to wild rabbits. And um, when that happened, you know, it essentially opened up a whole new world of possibilities. A virus that was pretty disadvantaged here in the United States now has a um, almost limitless vector source to move through and spread to other rabbits and unfortunately spread back to domestic rabbits. Um, and that's the conundrum that we're facing as an industry right now. Um, global distribution of RHD is a little bit outdated, but you know, it's, it's a large part of the world. Um, uh, it's endemic in um, Europe, uh, Australia, China, um, Russia, Northern Africa, and, um, and then obviously in the United States, um, it's going to be endemic now, unfortunately, uh, because of the mutation that has happened recently. Um, this is uh, the current USDA map in July. So um, again, the epicenter is the southwestern United States, and it has um, spread pretty quickly. You know, in March it was in a small little sliver around Mexico, and um, over the past several months it has. Uh, march steadily in random places and you know the uh, general rule of thumb is if they find rabbits that are suspiciously dead in areas in the southwest or surrounding there they generally will test them for rhd um, um, so this is again uh july 2020 this is uh, august 2020 and i think um the thing to just keep in mind is right now it's mostly in the southwest but it is moving and it's being discovered in new places all the time like i mentioned before um, wyoming's just waiting for it to come uh, and i think um, having a good uh, state animal health official will help that process and um, uh, having more facilities to actually confirm rhd will help as well um, so just going back to March 2020, um, RHDV2, the variant mutated and it um, jumped to the two main wildlife rabbits we have in the United States, um, the uh, jackrabbit and the American cottontail. Um, 
the thing that is concerning, obviously, is that a um, wildlife reservoir makes this a huge problem for us. Um, if you think about it, I mean, I drive home from work or ride my bike home and I always see a rabbit in my yard and probably most of you do as well. If you're in the Southwest, you probably see them um, in more desert and brush settings, but they're ubiquitous. They're all over the place. They have a very important role in the food chain. Um, as you all know, rabbits are not the most hardy animals and they are um, prey species. So they are meant to be in large quantities, reproduce quickly and be expendable quickly. And um, you know, there's thought that maybe the fact that the mortality and morbidity is so high that uh, they'll just burn themselves out in rabbits, but you'll see in a little bit, it's not that simple. I think um, viruses are smart. They know how to spread, they know how to adapt, and they know how to become more efficient as time goes on. And I think that's probably what's going to happen now that they have such a huge population to reproduce in. I do think that you as rabbit breeders probably need to get used to the fact that this is going to become an endemic disease. Um, and it's, again, I go back to the fact that it's not the end of the world. Um, lots of countries have learned to live with this virus and um, even in some instances uh, uh, find ways to outsmart it. So it's not at the end of the world by any stretch. So how is it spread? Um, that's a great question. It's spread really easily. Um, it's spread via as simple as um, brushing, um, like fomites, so things like brushes, um, tattoo gun, um, uh, random things that could get organic matter on them, so carrier bottoms, things like that. It's obviously spread by rabbits, um, domestic rabbits and wild rabbits now. Um, and I guess the thing that um, is scary is, you can have asymptomatic rabbits, meaning um, just like asymptomatic people with COVID, they don't show any outwardly signs. Maybe they just look a little bit unthrifty, but they may be carrying um, RHD. And those rabbits are at a risk of spreading it to um, your rabbits or rabbits in your, um, in your yard. Um, it can be transmitted by insects. So insects like to lay on rabbit poop and eat it. And um, that organic matter, can be transmitted distances, you know, sometimes as far as um, miles away. Hot, humid summers, like I'm experiencing right now in North Carolina, um, it's probably very easy to spread it if it was down here. And then obviously, you know, the pet rabbit industry is a huge issue, um, not just show rabbits, but pet rabbits. People have them in their house. Um, people might track stuff in on their feet and things like that. Um, the thing that's scary about RHD is, again, going back to the fact that wild rabbits are at the absolute bottom of the food chain. So they are a food resource for our predators, foxes, coyotes, um, feral dogs, cats. These, these predators are not the most um, clean when they eat. You know, they can spread pieces of organic matter around and they can act as um, vectors for the disease. So. Um, pest control is really important. We'll go over that in a little bit about how um, making sure those things are uh, monitored and taken care of uh, is really important if you have a rabbit tree. And then um, obviously other animals low on the food chain as well can move the virus around. So things like rats, mice, bats, stuff like that. Um, those are things that you need to prevent and look out for in your rabbit tree. Um, so some signs of RHD for you guys to look at uh, if you suspect you might have the disease. There's the per acute signs, which means um, it's gonna happen pretty early on um, in the progression of the disease. Again, it, doesn't, it gets pretty nebulous. Rapid death with no clinical signs. I mean, you know from raising rabbits, that could be a lot of different things. The rabbit could have broken its back in the middle of the night due to a thunderstorm. Uh, the rabbit could have had um, gastrointestinal stasis and its stomach could have ruptured. Your rabbit could have had um, just a you know random uh, failure to thrive. I mean, there's a lot of things that can cause your rabbit to randomly die. So not very specific. Um, so it can be confused with a lot of different diseases. If you have the option and you have, I'm gonna warn you in advance, um, you wanna do this in a part of your rabbit tree where there's no other rabbits, a separate room, maybe in your garage, somewhere where you can easily clean and um, uh, use uh, chemical disinfectants afterwards. But if you can necropsy, uh, that really can help kind of 
zero in and clue you into whether or not this is really a problem that you as a owner should be worried about and need to alert higher authorities. Um, acute signs are more, they, they happen quickly um, and uh, they, they, once these start, you know that things are not going to be going very well. Um, your rabbit may have difficulty breathing. You know, rabbits are obligate nasal breathers. They have to breathe through their nose. If you notice, rabbits are stretched out with their neck extended dorsally to the sky, and they are breathing very rapidly with their nose or using their abdomen to breathe. So they're kind of like pushing into their chest to breathe. Those are all signs of, um, you know, difficulty breathing. In them. If a rabbit's panting, it's not good, not good at all. Um, going back to the middle of RHD, hemorrhage, hemorrhagic. Um, if they're randomly bleeding from the nose, mouth, or anogenital region, that is highly suspicious for RHD. Not a lot of diseases are going to cause that. You know, rabbits can get clotting disorders just like any other species, but, um, you know, it doesn't generally happen out of the blue. So if that does happen, that should really um, raise your ears and get you thinking about RHD. Again, consider necropsy if you have the availability to do it and you have a clean, safe space to do that. But definitely wear PPE during this um, procedure. You want to have a face mask on. If you have a bouffant or skull cap to protect your hair, wear a gown or a, um, uh, some, an apron that you can wash afterwards uh, pretty thoroughly or just throw away. Um, it's important to note that most rabbits aren't going to get to the stage where they would come to see me, the veterinarian. But if they did, if I drew blood, I'd probably see anemia. They wouldn't have many red blood cells. They'd have a high white counter leukocytosis, and they'd have abnormal clotting factors. So maybe they wouldn't have many platelets, or if we tested their prothrombin timer, um, that would be uh, abnormal. So um, the signs to look for, obviously, uh, blood, hemorrhage. If you see random blood coming out of the nose, I mean, you've all seen what nasal discharge looks like, it should never be blood. Uh, blood from the anal genital region, um, don't confuse that with porphyria, which is the kind of tint that urine can take on in rabbits. And it oftentimes is associated with stress or just a random thing. And it doesn't necessarily have to be associated with stress, but usually that's gonna be more of a orange or rust color, not a dark red or frank blood color. Um, you see on the bottom left corner that rabbit has um, icterus in its eyes. So it's, um, uh, you're, you're seeing uh, yellowing and then also you might see hyphema or blood in the anterior chamber of the eye. Congestion of the organs um, with blood and uh, obviously the classic position after they die is that prostrate condition where their head is arched back because it's uncomfortable and painful. These, uh, these rabbits are bleeding to death internally. So. Um, there's some subacute signs, so less obvious, harder to pin down. Again, could be lots of other, other things it could be. Um, again, less severe compared to the uh, acute. Um, these rabbits oftentimes will develop antibodies, which um, you know is great in the end of the day, but um, if they're actively shedding the virus, that's gonna do you or anybody around you no good, especially if you have a rabbit in the middle of a rabbit tree that has this disease. Then there's a chronic form, which, you know, is the more kind of puzzling form where it, um, they lose weight, they have a fever, you know, rabbits can, normal for them can be as high as 103.5. So it usually has to be pretty hot, like 105, 106 or so. Um, and they die several weeks later, which, you know, again, going back to what does this resemble? I mean, it resembles lots of stuff. I mean, a lot of rabbits don't thrive and don't do well, and that could be due to a lot of different reasons, genetic, environmental, feed, all that stuff. So it can easily be confused with lots of other things. Going back to the necropsy, um, target organs to look at, liver, it's generally gonna be very congested. You want like a nice mahogany color, but normally you're gonna see dark red and kind of swollen looking. You want sharp edges on the spleen and these will be more rounded. Um, the spleen, which is a reservoir for blood in rabbits is gonna be heavily congested as well. Kidneys and heart will be um, uh, full of blood as well or infarcts, which are just little areas of um, blood clotting that you'll see. So usually it's gonna be multifocal. It'll be in multiple different organs. And um, if you open up a rabbit and you see blood everywhere, I mean, uh, a little alarm should go off in your head. 
Um, a little note on the strains, I had talked about them earlier. Uh, so RHDV1, that's more widespread and common. I mean, it's, a lot, it's in a lot more of the world uh, as a representation of the virus than RHDV2. Now that obviously could change now that it's in the United States. It tends to afflict older rabbits and it has a short incubation period, which, um, you know, if you see rabbits die really quickly, it may be RHDV1. It's not very common here, but um, it's, it's something to be aware of. Um, RHDV2 is obviously the more recent strain. It actually tends to afflict younger rabbits and has a longer incubation period, which unfortunately is not very useful to you as a rabbit breeder, because if a rabbit is infected with RHD, it may have it and it may shed it, um, and it may be at risk to give it to other rabbits, which you know you have to keep that in mind if you have a rabbit that might not be in its in best condition, that's probably not the best one to bring to a rabbit show, or maybe none of the rabbits around it either. Um, and then, as we know, in RHDV2 was only present in domestic rabbits, which in Europe, they the domestic rabbits are um, are the wild rabbits. So that's where our domestic rabbits originated from. Um, so the diagnosis of RHD, it's almost always post-mortem. Um, generally speaking, uh, rabbits aren't going to live long enough to treat, but um, it's done uh, via re re reverse transcriptase PCR testing, um, very similar to the way COVID's tested for. And usually if you're submitting a sample, the highest yield tissue is the liver. Um, it's important to keep in mind that RHD is a reportable disease in the United States. Reportable diseases are a very serious issue. Um, if they are present, it is your obligation to share that with health officials in your state because they um, are a major danger to our um, animal population here in the United States. Um, I'll talk a little bit in, the, uh, in a little while about the idea of maybe getting rid of that as a reportable disease, or at least the classifying it as a reportable disease or foreign animal disease, so maybe we can have more widespread access to the vaccines available in Europe. Um, so if RHD is confirmed, um, you generally want to reach out to your state animal health official. Um, every state has one. Uh, it's usually something you can find with a quick Google search. Um, if you don't know how to get a hold of that person, you can always contact your local veterinarian who has knowledge about rabbits and they can get you in touch with the state veterinarian. Um, it, since it is a reportable disease, it is something that um, they will take over afterwards, unfortunately. It's kind of out of your hands at that point. Um, they will come in and likely depopulate all the sick rabbits and the healthy rabbits around them. Um, they will uh, have a pretty detailed discussion with you. Um, a lot of people have heard about contact tracing with COVID. A very similar process happens if you suspect a for, um, an animal disease like this. And then obviously your um, rabbitry and premise will be quarantined because uh, they don't want the disease to get out to anybody else. Um, treatment, I think the thing to keep in mind is most rabbits aren't going to live long enough to treat. Um, you know, a very small percentage of them will survive, but for the most part, these rabbits do not have any immunity against this virus and they don't have an adequate um, time to mount a response before they die. Um, if they even survive, the prognosis is still not very good. Um, so if you have access to a veterinarian, you suspect a rabbit has RHD, again, um, in the rare circumstance that you um, were treating it for something else and maybe you suspected RHD, subcutaneous fluids may help vitamin B12 to replace lost B vitamins from the stool. Um, Non-steroidals like meloxicam can help reduce fever. And then um, Yunnan Bio is a uh, um, Chinese herb that can help uh, promote clotting because these uh, rabbits are hemorrhaging everywhere. Uh, if you have uh, rabbits dying at home and you're trying to intervene, uh, you know, fluid therapy helps. So electrolyte replacement, critical care, things like that. Um, and then over-the-counter NSAIDs like aspirin can be used. But again, I think it's important to just realize that if you're getting to the point where you think you need to treat, it's probably too late. Um, I'm going to encourage you all, until we have a better strategy to prevent this, that prevention is the best practice. Um, quarantine. So if you have new rabbits coming into your barn and you um, have 
receive them from anywhere, really, um, it's best to quarantine them, uh, ideally for a period of at least two weeks so you can uh, monitor for any signs of uh, disease. And it's not just RHD, you know, if you want to monitor for respiratory disease and other things like that, it's really important, I think. Um, this infect all sur surfaces thoroughly. I think this is one of the things that um, all rabbit breeders and clubs should really do their best to adhere to and be really, really um, OCD about it. And you know, the nice thing that has happened concurrently is COVID's happened. So a lot of you guys are being extra careful anyway for those of you that are having shows, face masks, but I'm gonna encourage you just scrub the living heck out of these things. Um, generally a good one to 10 dilution of bleach is sufficient, but um, you know, make sure it's thoroughly cleaned and really important. I mean, even before you clean it, don't just dump bleach on a bunch of poop adhered to a board. You have to remove the organic matter. Um, this is a really hardy virus. I mean, it can survive freeze thaw cycles outside. It can survive in frozen meat. Um, it can survive in lots of different things. You need to be vigilant about making sure this stuff's removed from your um, facility before you store it in a trailer for six months or a year. Um, get in the habit of sanitizing hands between uh, uh, handling rabbits. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I, I'm a veterinarian. I wash my hands 30 to 40 times a day. My hands get really, really dry. Um, you, you as judges in particular will probably have to get used to the fact that you should definitely use that bottle of Purell that the club has provided to you, probably between most rabbits you handle. Um, and I know it's a pain in the butt and it, it gets sticky and it's gross, but it's just, it's one way you can not transmit this disease between rabbits and um, kind of help protect the rabbits that you're looking at and protect the herd at home that you might have. Um, you need to control environmental pests. And that doesn't just include things that are at the bottom of the food chain, that includes things at the top of the food chain like predators. So you need to have a secure space to store your rabbits. Um, you don't wanna have any uh, areas that things can crawl through or dig under, things like that. Um, and uh, uh, just make sure that you have uh, preventatives in there to not have any intruders that could bring that into your rabbitry. And then, um, Going back to wild rabbits, this was not on the list before, but it is now. Um, you need to be careful about wild and feral rabbits. You know, if you have a good barn cat that likes to hunt, maybe a good idea to let them loose around your rabbit tree, um, as long as they're comfortable with the fact that the prey they're hunting is not the prey, the same as the prey that you're raising in the rabbit barn. But um, if you have the ability to control the pests, that is a really good strategy because, um, uh, sorry, control the pests, meaning the rabbits, good strategy to um, uh, you know, keep them away. It might be a good idea to plant a garden uh, you know, several hundred feet away from your rabbit tree with lots of yummy vegetables that rabbits like to eat so they stay away from your facility. Um, some of these are geared towards shows. I mean, I, I would, it's hard for me to say a blanket statement, you shouldn't show at all in states that have had RHD. I mean, it, I think you just need to exercise caution. Um, just because they have not reported a new case of RHD in a state that you might be showing in does not mean the virus has magically disappeared. I have no idea what the virus is doing in that state. Um, my suspicion is it's probably in some reservoir of wildlife at this point in that state. Um, the, the problem with rabbits again is they rapidly reproduce and um, as soon as a population's removed, a whole different set is ready to take their place and compete for the same resources they were eating. Um, try to avoid using foraged items in the cage. You know, if you guys pick stuff outside, it probably wouldn't be a good idea at this point. You may wanna go to the grocery store or get it from another site from a friend or family that doesn't have um, uh, lots of wild rabbits nearby. Other things you could think about would be using raised beds or putting cages around the um, plants that you're growing. Um, I would exercise caution when you're transporting rabbits through regions with confirmed RHD. Um, you know, I, I think it's wise to just be careful. I think one of the things you should have gotten from the previous slides is it's extraordinarily easy to transmit. So um, especially with organic matter and uh, if you are driving through areas, you probably just wanna drive right through and not stop to um, fill up for gas, maybe wait till you're in the next state. If you're a judge or a registrar, I would um, plan accordingly. 
I think uh, on both sides of the coin, if you're a judge, you should be prepared to uh, potentially not be able to judge if your area of the country has an outbreak, especially if you live in the Southwest. Um, and then if you are a uh, registrar or, or even a club that's hiring, you need to have a, a backup plan ready to go because uh, many times those people are not gonna be available um, at a moment's notice. And then finally, the vaccination strategy. You know, this is unfortunately not a very widely available option yet. Um, I've received lots of uh, questions from pet owners and rabbit breeders about um, the availability of the vaccine in the Carolinas. And, you know, we don't have it here because we don't have an outbreak. And the uh, USDA has been very explicit with their uh, limited use of that vaccine. Uh, but if you have the option, uh, by all means, I would strongly recommend you take advantage of it. Um, if you haven't watched the video yet, uh, Chris Zemney did a really tremendously good video on uh, operating a vaccine clinic. She worked her butt off to do that. Um, I do think that, you know, if you're prepared to commit to something like that, she'd be a great resource to look out to um, if you're in California and any other states that have um, allowed for use of those vaccines. Um, vaccination is readily available in the UK and Europe. Um, they've had RHD for a while. It's endemic and they've done just fine. They know how to live with it. And I think um, the United States is going to have to learn how to live with it as well. Uh, it has good protection. Um, you know, it's made from uh, rabbits that have been infected with the virus and they've uh, inactivated it in a way that it's not infectious to you, your rabbit. Um, uh, it has limited availability, though. These are not enormous companies like the pharmaceutical companies we have in the United States. Um, they don't have the resources that we have, and uh, they don't have the distribution network that we have. So because of that, it's hard to get. Um, you know, Chris Zemini was really lucky. She uh, All the stars aligned, and she was able to uh, import the vaccine. Um, I, have, uh, I have been told... Uh, from some sources at the USDA that, um, you know, these companies are, uh, again, that they, they can't keep up a lot of times with the demand, uh, depending on who's asking for it. So um, uh, I know the USDA is trying to help um, kind of guide the direction of vaccination in the United States. Um, it is approved for the most part in states where active outbreaks are reported. So if you have an active outbreak, again, engage your uh, local veterinarian and uh, there's good resources available now about importing the vaccine. And again, uh, honestly, if your vet wants to import the vaccine, um, you and your vet just watch the video that Chris Zemini made because it's great. It goes through the whole thing for you. Um, Budget of $20 to $30 per vaccine. Um, and just remember that they do require boosters, uh, usually on an annual basis. Um, and uh, that cost can be driven down the larger the dose and the larger um, amount of rabbits you have to, um, uh, in, to vaccinate. Um, currently, it has to be administered by a veterinarian. Um, you know, down the road, who knows what might happen with this vaccine. It's in its infancy right now. We don't even have a stateside vaccine, but maybe down the road, um, it will be an option for you as a breeder to have this vaccine in your hands and use it. But it's such a new concept in the United States that um, the USDA will only trust it in a veterinarian's hands at the moment. Um, there are two vaccines that are allowed for importation, Filovac and Aravac. Um, uh, both of them uh, have pretty good immunity um, uh, and uh, can be imported uh, from their respective companies. Uh, what is not approved uh, is RHD myxomatosis um, combination uh, made by Merck. Um, the reason why is Filovac and Irovac are inactivated vaccines, meaning that they have taken um, the virus and they have uh, chopped off all the sections that are virulent that could kill your rabbit and the part that is going to stimulate the antibodies in your rabbit have been um, engineered in that vaccine so that you can give it and have um, uh, uh, the complacency that you have no risk of spreading the virus. So it's a common question that people have. If you're giving the two inactivated vaccines, there's no way you're gonna pass RHD to another rabbit. Um, it's not going to shed it or anything like that. All you're going to do is you're going to find antibodies in that rabbit, which is what we want anyway. Um, RHD myxomatosis, though, that is a modified live vaccine. Um, it has good immunity in rabbits, but uh, 
the United States will not allow, allow modified live vaccine importation right now for a uh, foreign vaccine. So at the moment, we don't have access to that vaccine. You know, uh, I'm not going to lie, Merck's a, Merck has a large presence in the United States, and you know, maybe down the road they'll um, realize that there's uh, a market for rabbits. Um, the vaccination protocols, and again, this is a little bit of rehash from Chris Demney's uh, uh, presentation, but rabbit has to have a form of ID. Um, that's not a big deal for y'all because um, most rabbits have tattoos for uh, rabbit, uh, for pet rabbit owners, that might be a little bit more um, uh, complicated. You know, some of them may microchip the rabbit, just some form of ID. Um, we generally give it subcutaneously between the um, shoulder blades. And uh, common side effects uh, can include a nodule at the injection site, a transient fever, or um, alopecia, which is just hair loss. Um, I, I think um, any rabbit with any injection always has the risk of a reaction. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of good information about vaccinating rabbits. There's nothing approved in the United States, never has been, and um, this is all new territory for us. For those of you who might be a little bit squirrely about the idea, uh, maybe it's a rabbit that has significant worth to you, certainly giving it um, diphenhydramine or Benadryl beforehand would be a good idea at a dose of approximately one milligram per pound. So um, pretty easy math. Most common side effect from Benadryl in rabbits would be sedation. Um, the Filovac, you give the first injection at 10 weeks and you boost her annually. Um, pretty simple. Your Avac, you can give the first injection at 30 days or about four weeks and the immunity lasts 12 months. Uh, the veterinarian and the owner must maintain a record of vaccination. That's usually pretty easy for a veterinarian, but just keep the file in your folder if you end up having it done. Um, I do think going forward, uh, widespread vaccination is probably going to be a game changer to keep this disease at bay. I'm just going to be truthful with you. With a wild rifle, wildlife reservoir, I think it's gonna be really hard to get rid of this virus now. Um, I think it's gonna be with us for a long time and viruses are smart and they will adapt and change and learn how to spread more efficiently. And I do worry, um, I think as soon as the virus crosses the Midwest, it will probably be in the whole United States at that point because that's when it hits um, lots of cottontails. Um, it, it is a challenge in the rabbit industry. The rabbit industry is fragmented. It is not well organized. Um, there's a lot of stakeholders that don't talk to each other. Rabbit breeders tend to not talk to pet rabbit owners who tend to not talk to lab animal people and they don't talk to meat people. Um, I think the thing to keep in mind is regardless of whether they're friends or enemies at this point, they all need to be stakeholders and um, folks that we use as a uh, united front to help get vaccination a little bit more widespread in the United States and not just an emergency basis. Um, the other thing about it is rabbits are in a weird interstitial space. Um, you can have them as a pet and you can eat them. I mean, there's not a lot of pets we have like that in the United States that are, you know, they, they straddle that border very fluently. Um, you know, I just did a continuing ed yesterday on a new medicine I'm going to start using in my practice that really has good anesthesia in rabbits. And um, it's not licensed for rabbits just because rabbits can be eaten in the United States and they have to go through a whole different uh, process to get it approved for them. Um, the two broad strategies that they are looking at right now in the United States to maybe get this a bit more widespread is um, declassify RHD as a foreign animal disease. And if they do that, then that allows the importation of that vaccine to be essentially widespread and um, a lot uh, lot more easy to distribute locally. You know, like I was saying, Merck has a vaccine that they could potentially uh, manufacture in the United States and distribute stateside. You know, again, there's a, there's a decent um, uh, market incentive for this. At the end of the day, pharmaceutical companies are going to um, focus primarily on dogs and cats uh, and on the livestock end, cattle and horses, and then everything else kind of gets um, brushed to the side. Um, and then the other option would be to develop a vaccine stateside. And there have been some companies that have um, reached out, the ARBA and myself, uh, about that option. Um, you know, unfortunately, those things are in their infancy right now. And we have to keep in mind that there's a global pandemic going on in the human uh, healthcare field. 
which unfortunately, you know, this is a devastating disease to the industry, but um, it's probably the uh, priorities are with um, getting rid of COVID and um, some of the other things that maybe put on the back burner. But I'm hoping one of these two things happens. I mean, um, the uh, Association of Exotic Animal Veterinarians that I'm a member of is really pushing hard to um, get the RHD declassified. Um, and, you know, I do think it helps the fact that it's probably going to be endemic in the United States and maybe the fact that it is going to be endemic. I mean, why call it a foreign animal disease anymore? So, um, so uh, that's kind of the gist that I wanted to go over today. Um, I think you guys should, one of the things that I think you should take away from this lecture is, you know, the morbidity and mortality is high, over 90%. So, if your rabbits become infected, there's a decent chance that they're going to perish from the disease. Um, so it's it's one of those things where why risk it? Um, where is you know being cavalier and you know not being careful about uh, quarantining, cleaning stuff thoroughly? It it can be really challenging. I think sometimes with this. Um, too strange to know, RHDV1, that's the most common and widespread, RHDV2, that's the more recent one, and I think it, at the end of the day, it will probably be the more widespread one we're going to see in the United States um, now and for the foreseeable future. Um, susceptible species, the wild European rabbits and domestic rabbits have always been the bread and butter of this virus, but um, uh, now we have cottontails and jackrabbits, which is a um, major development and unfortunately a basically a limitless uh, uh, reservoir for this virus. Um, transmission is super duper easy. It is a very hardy virus and it um, easily gets transmitted between secretions of sick rabbits, direct contact of fomites like you know a grooming brush or a shoe, uh, organic or inorganic. Um, it can persist in pelts, infected meat, carcasses, it survives freeze-thaw cycles. These are all things that make the virus very, very good at survival. And again, it's able to persist in chilled, frozen, and decom decomposing meat for months. Um, and, you know, I, I think one of the things that's important to remember is, much like everything, um, the virus evolves, but the rabbits evolve too. And one of the things that might be interesting that happens as a result of this, I mean, I'm not going to sugarcoat this, it's pretty terrible that it's in the wild rabbits now. But the thing about wild rabbits is they are reproducing at a rate significantly faster than domestic rabbits. I mean, uh, life cycle for a rabbit is really, really short. It's, as you know, it's rare for one to grow up and be an adult most of the time, just because, again, they're at the bottom of the food chain, they get consumed really fast by predators. So rabbits have really um, quick uh, heredity and they can pass down traits very quickly if they need to. Um, good example is in Australia, some of the wild rabbits there are developing RHDV2 antibodies. And, you know, over time, those rabbits reproduce and their offspring have better immunity as a whole. And maybe something similar will happen in the United States with our wild rabbits. Um, it just remains to be seen. Um, and that's all I got for you guys. Um, uh, thank you for attending and uh, uh, I guess we'll uh, take questions now if anybody has any. Thank, thank you, Jay. That's a really great presentation. And I know that you've been instrumental on coming up with a set of guidelines that all of us can use within the industry uh, to be able to combat the, combat the virus from, you know, how we have to re-look at the way that we handle shows and do shows uh, and manage it uh, or protect our herds at home. Um, as well as giving recommendations for judges. So, I mean, I definitely thank you personally for your efforts of doing that as quickly as you did, especially as, as busy as you are as, as a, a veterinarian and, and professional in, the, uh, um, in your professional career, and then also uh, caring about the, the rabbit hobby as a whole. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and thank you for, and, and for your committee too, for your guys' involvement. Uh, it's definitely instrumental as experts that we appreciate the value you provide to to the hobby. Yeah, it's been a, it's been an interesting time for all of us. Yeah. Um, so some of the questions we have, uh, the first one is, what uh, can ARBA members do to work together to fight against the virus and, and help each other? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, um, I think again, 
we as a organization are a stakeholder in this and um, we have expressed very specifically to the USDA that um, you know this is something that we are gravely concerned about this affects our entire association and you know a lot of people have used the British Rabbit Council as a model of you know the um, how they address this but the problem is the the difference in membership is enormous. I mean, um, we have so many members in the ARBA and we have so many rabbit shows. And I think the the thing that you as an ARBA member should probably focus on is number one, um, working with your local clubs to make them as safe as humanly possible. I mean, I, I have no idea how long we're gonna be doing all the preventative measures for COVID. I mean, I would argue probably until a, a stateside vaccines available for COVID too, but you know, think about a lot of the things that you guys have changed in your lives for COVID and try to think about how they would translate into rabbits. So, you know, we can't have your rabbits wear a face mask, but we can say that um, maybe between every breed, we're going to clean the table sufficiently with a, um, a one to 10 dilution of bleach, let it air out. You know, is it going to add more time to the show day? Sure. But is it going to protect rabbits better? Yeah, it will. Um, I'd say also, um, if you have the ability to work with your local veterinarians and educate them on the disease, um, it will really help. Um, I, I'm just going to be honest, most vets know nothing about rabbits and have no interest in, in knowing anything about rabbits. Um, but some of them are willing to learn and, uh, you know, it may be a business opportunity for them to be able to offer the vaccine if you're in a state where it could be offered. I mean, many owners are willing to work with you if you just, um, reach out to them. And then um, the last thing I'd say is, uh, I think um, if you have access to congressmen and senators and things like that, I mean, it's never a bad idea to reach out to them. Um, obviously, I think they have a lot on their plate at the moment, but uh, this would be something that if you have direct access, some of some ARBA members have more um, uh, access to those things than others, definitely something to think about. That definitely makes a lot of sense. Uh, do you think that, and, and you talked about this or in, in your talk, but you think that once we end up, or if USDA classifies it into that new category as no longer a foreign disease, that then it makes it much easier, or does that, is that would be what it takes in order to make the vaccine available for breeders all the way across the country, if they wanted to use that as a tool? Yeah, well, and again, I think if we can declassify it as a um, foreign animal disease, distribution will be able to ratchet up really quickly, and that will drive the cost down, hopefully. Um, that's the hope. I mean, um, I, I do think that it, it would be easier for a company just to kind of pick up where the European company left off, but um, the, the United States is a among the most difficult places to get anything in vaccine wise, biologic wise, pharmaceutical wise. So it, I don't think it's going to happen overnight. You know, I, I'm not sure what's going to happen with vaccination. I, I do think as a breeder, it's probably your best protection against the disease. I mean, I, I would argue that biosecurity and cleaning is important, but at the end of the day, if your rabbit is exposed to RHD, it doesn't matter how clean the surface is. Um, your rabbit's probably going to die. So uh, if you have the ability to vaccinate your rabbit, um, that is something that you should take advantage of because it's going to protect your herd. And um, the other thing to keep in mind is I don't know what's going to happen down the road. I, I would argue that that's a topic that the ARBA board is probably throwing around uh, in terms of what rabbit shows will look like in the future. I mean, I don't know if... Um, in order to have entry into a show, you'd need vaccination or not. I don't know if um, in order to um, get into a show, you'd have to sign an affidavit saying that you haven't been in an RHD endemic area. I, I just don't know. I think the virus is too early on in its um, uh, evolution into wild rabbits to know that for certain. And we're just going to have to see how quickly it spreads, where it spreads, things like that. All right, and on the next question, um, can, or this is from uh, Renee Johnson, um, can this virus be spread from rabbits to another species such as swine, uh, cats, dogs, horses, cattle? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, 
we we don't see that yet. Now, never say never. I mean, we didn't think COVID could jump to dogs or cats, but it can. So um, uh, viruses evolve, they can jump species, but at the moment, the answer is no. So if something changes, you'll know about it. Okay. And the final question that we have is from Dave Hauser. Uh, if my rabbits are not inoculated uh, with the vaccine, can rabbits uh, or can my rabbits get it from others that have been inoculated? Um, that's a good question. And it's um, a two part answer. Your ra the rabbits that are vaccinated are not shedding the virus and they never will be. They just have antibodies against it. Now, if that rabbit um, somehow got exposed to RHD from another rabbit, like through organic matter, rabbit sneezed blood on it, and that rabbit brushed up against that other rabbit, yes, it could transmit that way. The series of events to get to that would be so random and bizarre that I don't think that's even feasible. So I think the, the likelihood of that's pretty low. Okay, uh, that's all the questions that we have that have came in. Um, again, I greatly appreciate what you, the work you've done, Jay, and uh, adding your expertise and looking out for the hobby in the long term. And uh, thank you for participating tonight and, and giving this great information to everybody in our industry that is looking at how to handle the virus now that it's here and what the landscape looks like. So thank you so much. Absolutely. And David, thank you for the rabbit show. It's a really cool resource. And um, I think the industry is better for it because you do it. Thank you. Awesome. Okay,